Thank you so much. Some of you act like you're really enjoying being at church today. Now, let's be honest real quick. How many of you would rather be here than to be in jail? Raise your hand, all right? How many of you know a member that is in jail right now, all right? So, yeah. Let's get real for a second, all right? How many would rather be here than at the beach? Raise your hand. A lot of you did not raise your hand. I'm just glad you're honest, all right? You don't need to lie in church, all right? So, what well, is great to see you today. Thank you so much for being here. And those of you that join us online, thank you as well. Well, today we're going to begin a brand new series. And uh, we're calling this series, Identify Yourself. Um, we're going to go through the book of Colossians this summer. In fact, I'm going to read every verse in the book of Colossians uh, this summer and preach from every one of these verses. And our plan is to discover who you are in Jesus Christ. And I hope you'll be here every Sunday. And if you're not here, if you're out of town, I hope you'll watch online. All right. And so um, very important. We're going to be learning what the Bible says about who you are in Jesus Christ. Mark Twain once said, the two greatest days in a man's life are the day that he was born and the day he figures out why. That's a great quote. I want to tweak it a little bit. I would say that the two greatest days in a believer's life are the day that he or she is born again and the day you figure out why. You see, who you are in Christ changes everything if you're really aware of who you are. You see, we have an identity crisis in our culture, do we not? Uh, the truth is, particularly young people, I mean, we see uh, in our culture today, people struggling with their identity, people struggling with figuring out who they are. Not only we see this in the media a lot, but also even online and in social media, there are so many people today that live what I call a filtered life. They live a life that they don't want anybody to know the real them, but they want to project some kind of image of who they're not. I heard about one woman that she had a lot of followers on one of the social media platforms, and she was known for being at the beach, taking pictures at the beach, and turns out that she wasn't at the beach at all. She was in the play sandbox behind the apartment where she lived. And uh, she would just filter this. She wanted everybody to think that she lived at the beach. Well, here's what I know. Uh, when you know who you are in Jesus Christ, it changes everything. When you know what the Bible says about you, it changes everything. So today what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna read Colossians 1 verses 1 to 14, and I'm going to read a couple verses, and I'm going to make some comments about it, and then I'll read some more and make some more comments. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Here's what it says. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now, let me just pause and say the apostle Paul is the one that wrote this. He wrote uh, more of the New Testament than any other writer and uh, he was not one of Jesus' 12 disciples, but he was one of the apostles. And what happened was, Paul, he was not a follower of Jesus while he was here on the earth, but Jesus made a special appearance to him. And this man was a religious terrorist. He killed Christians. And God radically transformed his life. And man, I love that. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. God can change you. God can help you. God can get you on the path that you're supposed to be on. He certainly did the Apostle Paul. And what I love about how Paul just starts out, that's kind of a standard greeting. But here's what he said. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Do you get the idea that Paul knew who he was? Now, you understand something, that there were critics in Paul's day that they said he was not an apostle. They criticized him. They talked about him. But do you know that when you know who you are, it doesn't matter what all the little voices say about you, okay? And so he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, 
to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, that's why it's called the book of Colossians, it was written to the Colossian church, and he said, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, I believe that the word of God is inspired by God. I believe God gave it to us. It's to be believed and it's to be obeyed. It is God's very word to us. Now, even though this is just simply, these couple verses, just simply a, a, an introduction, you find a lot even in an introduction. When God declares declare something or decrees something, you can learn a lot from it. Uh, so here's my first point, all right? Number one, coming, talking about uh, identity crisis, you are who God says you are. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. You're not who your critics say you are. You are who God says you are. That's very important to get down in your soul. That's sometimes a hard thing to believe, by the way. But here's, here's what I know. You're not who the world says you are. A lot of people, they live in their past. Maybe you've got some failure in your past. You know what the devil tries to tell you every time you go to do something for God? Every time you try to start something for God, he says, you're a failure. This is your past. You've always been this way. You can't be serious. There is no way you could do that. You're not who the world says you are. You're not defined by your past. You're not defined by your failures. And uh, the fact is, many of us, we live our life that way, do we not? Because we failed in the past, because we did something in the past, we don't want anybody to know about it. There are so many people that I have conversations with. In fact, there are many of you in this church that are faithful today. And before you started coming to this church, you said stuff like this. Man, if I walked into that church, the ceiling would fall in. You ever heard somebody say that? <clears throat> and they're just talking about their past. They're talking about that they, um, you know, weren't very religious. They weren't very Christian. They weren't very nice. And there were a lot of things they were not. But here's what God says. You are who God says you are, not who the world says you are. And you're not who your accomplishments say you are. We can take the negative, but also the positive. You know what happens to many of us? We get defined by our accomplishments. We get defined by our job. Now, nothing wrong with having a job. You ought to have a job. But that's not who you are. I mean, the truth is, I'm a pastor. And I'll be honest with you. I'm just being transparent here. I've struggled with that myself. Because my identity is so tied in being the pastor of this church. Now, has God called me to do that? Yes. Has God gifted me to do this? Yes. Has God led me to do this? Yes. But who I am is not the pastor of this church. I am who God says I am. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am a son of God. I'm a part of his family. And so you're not who your accomplishments say you are. If you think that you are what your bank account says you are, you're missing the point. If you think you are who your uh, name, what your name plaque on your office says you are, you're not your accomplishments. Maybe you are um, one of these people that, and, and we've had a lot of people, and, and I'm not being negative or critical about a 12-step program. I think many of them are wonderful, and I love it when people are able to get off of whatever is addicting them. But one issue that I have with Christians that may be going to a 12-step program, they teach you that for the rest of your life, you introduce yourself. If you're an alcoholic, you say, hi, I'm Richie, I'm an alcoholic. Can I tell you, that's not what the Bible says. You're not who your past says you are. You're who Jesus says you are. And no matter what the addiction, no matter what, thing you struggled with, you know what? You're not that. You're not that any longer. You are delivered. And I could just tell you story after story after story of people that have been delivered. 
Identity is strengthened by submitting to the will of God. He said, I am an apostle by the will of God. When you follow God's will, your identity in Christ is going to be strengthened. And your identity grows strong through participation in the church. Did you get that he was talking about people in the church here? He talked about Timothy, our brother, and the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. He's talking about these group of people in the church. And here's what I'm going to tell you. You will always struggle with your identity until you get plugged in to a local church. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir. You're here today, all right? But look, the the bottom line is this. You and I, um, we need the church. We need what God does through the church in our lives. You say, well, I can um, worship God just as well out on the beach as I can in church. And that's true. You should be able to worship God wherever you are. Now, uh, I, hear, I hear some people say, well, I can worship God on the golf course. I can't. I, I'm too tempted to cuss because of how badly I play. <laughs> Not a lot of worshiping God going on when I'm on the golf course. But in theory, you should be able to worship God anywhere. But understand this. It's not just about worship, and it's not just about music, and it's not just about programming. It is about people and making those connections. You are not designed to do life alone. God designed you to live in community, and the Bible talks about how that we spur one another on to good works in the church. And we literally, and and the Bible doesn't say it this way, but I'll, I'll paraphrase it this way. You get some wind in your sails when you go to church. Anybody ever notice that? I hear people all the time say, man, I was discouraged this week and I felt down, but boy, I came to, I didn't feel like coming to church, but I came and I'm so glad that I did. Or I hear people say stuff like this. They say, you know, I, um, I, I feel like that you were talking just to me. Or, or they say things like this. You know what? Um, I needed that, and I'm going to live on that all week long. And, and, and that's the power of who you are in Jesus Christ. Your identity grows strong through participation in the church, and then discovering your identity brings grace and peace. I love what he said there. Grace and peace to you. In fact, if you read in the letters in the New Testament, almost all of them say that in some way or another. Grace and peace. Peace. Grace and peace. You get the idea that God wants you to know that when you are in relationship with him, he wants you to know about his grace. That's the undeserved, unmerited, unearned kindness and favor of God. You say, well, you know, I I, I blew it this week and boy, I got to really make up for it. Well, you do need to try to live better, but you can't make God love you anymore. Not any more than he does right now. You know why? Because grace is freely given. You don't earn it. I mean, if you did do something to earn it, then it wouldn't be free, would it? It'd be a payment for something you did. But we all know that the gospel teaches us that uh, we cannot earn our way to heaven. We cannot even earn our way into favor with God. It is grace and peace. I love the Hebrew word. Now, this is a New Testament word, so it's a Greek word. But the Hebrew in the Old Testament, the the word for peace is the word shalom. I love that word. It's a complete word. It means that God gives you peace in every area of your life, in your mind, in your emotions, in your relationships, in your health, in your job, in your body. It is complete harmony with God. Now, let me ask you a question. If you began to seek to live in harmony with God, how different would your life be? If instead of fighting every morning before you go to work, if instead of cussing people out on the way uh, driving through Atlanta traffic or McDonough traffic or whatever traffic you're in, you say, well, pastor, I can't believe you said cuss in church. Well, hang around with me and you'll figure it out, all right? So, but the, the truth is, some of you wouldn't say a cuss word on the way to work, but if somebody wrote it on a piece of paper, you'd sign your name to it, okay? Because it is so stressful when you're driving back and forth to work. What if instead of doing that, you had peace? 
you had harmony? What if instead of getting some road rage, you just lived in the peace and harmony that comes from God? Well, you are who God says you are. And God says that you're not your past, you're not your failure, not even your accomplishments, but you are. Do you know who God says you are? He says you're, when you're a believer, when you put your faith in Christ, you're a son or a daughter of God. He said you're a child of the king. He says that you are more than a conqueror, not just a conqueror, but more than a conqueror, which means those things that you think you cannot do, you can through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You think you cannot conquer your anger problem, but you can. You're more than a conqueror. You think that you cannot conquer uh, those bad thoughts that you have, but you can because you're more than a conqueror. You think that you cannot conquer the addiction that you have, but you can because you are more than a conqueror. You're not who the world says you are. You are who God says you are. Now let's read on. He says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. We're going to come back to that one. Of this you have heard before in, and I want you to note these words, the word of the truth. He's talking about the Bible, okay, and the gospel. He says, you have Heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing. The Bible says in the Old Testament, uh, God said, my word will not return unto me void. That's what he's saying, that the word of God being preached and the gospel being taught throughout the world is having effect. God promises that when you get the word of God in you, it's going to start to work on you. It's going to start to change you. It's going to be better for you. He says it's increasing, it's making a difference. He says, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is the, a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Now, we see there that talking about who you are in Christ, your identity in Christ, Paul, first of all, says, hey, you're who God says you are. Here's the second thing he says. Your identity is strengthened by the Word of God. In other words, when you get the Bible in your life, it's going to strengthen you, and it's going to help you know who you are, and it's going to help you learn to live the way God wants you to do it. Okay? Okay? Now, there's a couple things you got to do if you're going to get the Word of God in your life. One, you got to read it. Two, you got to hear it. You know, the Bible talks about hearing the Word of God a lot. And part of the reason for that is that they didn't have uh, iPhones back when this was written, okay? So they just could not look up the Bible app. In fact, they didn't even have, most people didn't even have a copy of Scripture. And so what would happen, they would come together and the Word of God would be read publicly. The Bible says in Romans, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, what does that mean? Well, you need to read it. You need to hear it. In other words, you need to take it in. Whatever medium you use, if you want to read it every day, and I read the Bible quite a bit. I'm a pastor, obviously. Uh, but you know what my favorite way um, it, to, to just get Scripture in me on a regular daily basis? I play it on my app when I'm driving back and forth. And, you know, I can go through the entire Bible just listening to it on my phone. I can do that in less than a year. If you were to take that challenge, whether it's sitting down to read it or hearing it, by playing it on the app when you're driving back and forth, you'd be amazed at how much of the Word of God you'd get in your life. You got to read it, you got to hear it, and then you got to believe it. Let me tell you, if you don't believe it, it doesn't matter if you read it or not. And let me, let me, let me tell you something. I know I quoted Mark Twain already. Mark Twain also said, he said, uh, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts of the Bible that I do understand that bother me so much. And, and let me tell you, 
I feel that way. You, you ever just read the Bible and that truth just gets right into you? You ever, you ever read the Bible when it says, be kind one to another? Maybe you just had an argument with your wife or your husband. Maybe you just got ticked off and told somebody off at work. Maybe your neighbor blew all of his leaves into your yard and you're going to go give him a piece of your mind. Let me, let me warn you, you don't have too much, so don't give too much of it away. Don't give him a piece of your mind. You need to keep all you got, right? Look, um, you and I need to understand that when it comes to the Word of God, you got to believe it. Let, let me give you another one. You read in the Bible where God promises that if you're generous, if you give, he's going to bless you. In fact, it tells us that he blesses us in multiple ways, not only uh, in multiple ways, but also financially, okay? But you know what? Until you start believing it, you're never going to become a generous person. Here's what I know about most Christians. In fact, I'd say all Christians. Um, you want to be generous, some of you don't know how to do it. Some of you are afraid to do it. But you, there is in your heart a desire to be generous. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, if you have kids, you give to them because you love them. Now, I don't have grandkids yet, but I understand that grandkids are awesome, all right? And those of you who have grandkids, uh, you love them more than you love your kids. Don't deny it. <laughs> you yelled at your kids. You would never yell at your grandbaby, all right? You, you would say to your kids, if they came to you and said, Mom, Dad, I, I, need, uh, I need a new computer, you would go into a diatribe about how money does not grow on trees and how that they need to get a job. They're only eight years old, but they need to get a job and quit mooching off of you. But if your grandbabies say that, you'll go buy them something from NASA if you have to, all right? You got to believe it, and then you got to apply it. James said this. He said, be doers of the word and not just hearers. There are a lot of people that they hear the word of God. They hear the word of God taught, and they're like, you go get them, preacher, and they don't apply it to themselves. Or uh, this is a common one. I've had so many people tell me <laughs> over the years, uh, boy, my wife needed to hear that, you know, or my husband needed to hear that. You know, they're a hearer of the word, but they're not a doer. They don't apply it to themselves. But God says, when you apply it, when you do it, it changes everything. Let me real quickly, because I know that some of you are getting worried that I'm not going to get through this outline, and you have, I'm, I've given you the outlines to write this summer, and, and some of you love that, and some of you are like, you'd get shaky if I didn't get all the blanks filled in, all right? So let me, let me, let me do this. Notice what God's Word gives you. It gives you a thankful heart. He said, I thank God. It gives you a knowledge of God. He said, uh, knowing the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to get to know God better? You got to read the Word of God. Uh, it gives you a better prayer life. He talked about when we pray for you. You want a better prayer life? Get the Word of God into your life. Uh, it gives you a stronger faith. He talked about your faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, as I've already said, Romans uh, ten seventeen. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You'll have a stronger faith. Um, it gives you a love for others. He talked about the love that you have for all the saints. Now, do you realize how miraculous a statement that is? Because, let's be honest, we normally can love those that we like. You know what I mean? Those people that make us feel good. Those people that we would like to hang out with. Those people that we wouldn't mind going to a movie with. Those people we wouldn't mind going out to eat with, right? But let's be honest, okay? In the church, there's always going to be somebody that's a little bit weird, all right? And if you say, well, I don't know of any weird people in our church. I got bad news for you. You're the one, all right? 
Now, look, here's the point. You're going to find people of all different stripes in life. And some people's personality is going to rub you the wrong way. It will. That's just life, okay? But you've got to love all the saints. You've got to love everyone. And here's what I've learned. There are some people, and can I just make a confession as a pastor? There are some people, and I love everybody. The Bible says that I'm supposed to do that, and I'm going to do what the Bible says. I love every one of you, no doubt about it. But there's some of you that I like better than others, if I'm going to be honest, okay? You say, well, who are those people that you like better? All of you in the room, those people that aren't here today are the ones I don't like as much as you, all right? Now, what I'm saying is this, you know, there are going to be some people that you go, well, this is strange. There are going to be some people that you look at and you say, well, that person's weird. And let me tell you, the day that we stop letting weird people in is the day that I'm not going to be the pastor of this church anymore because I'm weird. All right? I don't know how to take that clap right there because I said I'm weird and you clapped. Here's, here's the point. Uh, you're going to love others. You'll have a better outlook. He talked about the hope laid up for you in heaven. You'll have better productiv- productivity. He talked about bearing fruit. You want to be more productive in life? Read the Word of God. I promise you, you'll get better. You'll have a better understanding of God's grace. And then you'll have a dependence on the Holy Spirit. And here's what I know. When you begin to depend more on the Holy Spirit, your life is going to be better. You know what Galatians chapter 5 tells us this? It talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And it goes on to list nine different things that a lot of people don't think that they possess. And the truth is, you don't. None of us naturally possess all nine of the fruits of the Spirit. But here's the interesting thing. Fruit, I don't grow fruit. I can plant fruit. I can water fruit. I can fertilize fruit. But I can't grow it. You know why? Only God can grow fruit. And you know what the Bible is teaching us there? Because in Galatians 5, it it contrasts the works of the flesh. In other words, it's the stuff that I do. It's what I can produce, the works of the flesh. And he says that always leads to failure. But he said on the flip side of that, the fruit of the Spirit, that's God at work in your life. And he talks and he says there's love and joy and peace and patience. Anybody ever pray the prayer of the impatient person? God, give me patience and give it to me right now. I mean, he goes on and talks about goodness and faithfulness. And the last thing, this is interesting. He says you'll have self-control. Is there some area of your life you don't have control over? If you're human, you you have an area like that. Here's what God said. You have no right. You have no right to say, I'm not patient. Now, if you're an impatient person by nature like I am, just understand that God says that the work of the Spirit of God in your life will radically transform you and will give you more patience. Are you going to be perfect? No, no. But the good news is, he says that your identity is strengthened by the Word of God. Well, let let me go on. I won't have time to spend a lot of time on this last one. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light, and he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sin. And here's my last thought. Knowing your identity in Christ empowers you for successful living. And and if you have time, maybe go back and read it this afternoon. All these things that he promises us. Man, you're going to have an incredible 
an incredibly successful life if you do what he talks about here. Um, it'll change your prayer life. As we said, I've not ceased to pray for you. It'll change your prayer life. It'll give you insight for living. And here's what I love about this. He talked about the knowledge of God's will. The knowledge of God's will. What would happen in your life if you knew what God wanted you to do? And once again, I don't mean like, you know, just hoping that you get a feeling. I know that we get it from the Word of God. But look, I've had people that have come up to me and asked me to pray. I had one man come to me and asked me to pray for him one time. He was having an affair. He was married, having an affair with a woman that wasn't his wife. And he was just saying, you know, hey, I want you to pray that God will have his will and working this out with this woman that I'm, I won't say what I'm thinking, but doing on the side, you know, okay. And I'm like, are you out of your mind? I said, first of all, that is so against what Scripture teaches. I don't have to pray about that. I know that's not God's will for your life. But what if you were able to find the will of God? Now, there are many things in my life that I've found God's will about in big areas. I knew God called me to ministry when I was a teenager. I knew where God called me to go to Bible college as a 17-year-old boy. I, I knew God called me to marry the love of my life, Kim. We met when we were freshmen in college. And I knew, I prayed about it. I knew that was God's will. Plus, she was a really good kisser. So, um, <laughs> I knew that God was calling me to be a pastor. I, I knew that. Uh, I knew that it was God's will for me to start this church. But God's will is not just for the big things. Okay? It's for the daily things. L let me ask you a question. And this is just something for you to think about. Have you ever prayed about what God would have you to wear for that day? You say, oh, that's silly. Really? Have you ever prayed about what you're supposed to eat? Now, look, uh, you know, I'm not saying that uh, I'm not a dietitian, but I can pretty much say that if I'm praying about what God wants me to eat, he's probably not going to lead me to eat cheese fries every meal. Come on now. Hey, I, I'm not making fun of anybody, okay? Look at me, all right? So, obviously, I'm not praying that much about uh, all of that. But my point is this. We're to pray about everything. We're to find God's will in everything. Then he says you'll get spiritual wisdom. You need spiritual wisdom to live in this world. Let me tell you, you need spiritual wisdom with your kids. You need spiritual wisdom with your grandkids. You need spiritual wisdom for your work for your marriage. You need spiritual wisdom, the leadership of God. And then he says, understanding. I love 1 Chronicles 12, 32, talking about the nation of Israel and the tribes of Israel. There's a tribe called Issachar. And here's what it said about them. It said, the sons of Issachar understood the times and knew what Israel should do. You ever have wisdom when it comes to this life, your business dealings, your spending, what you do as far as a house or a car? Look, these men knew what to do and they understood the times. And, and when you begin to follow God, he'll give you that wisdom. It'll define your purpose in life. You want to find out your purpose in life? Learn who you are in Jesus Christ. He'll begin to live through you. It'll strengthen you. He said, you'll be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. I don't know if you've figured this out yet or not, but sometimes life is a marathon. I know we all talk about how short life is, but let me, let me just tell you, there are some things about life that are really long. You know what I mean? Life is too long to hold a grudge or an unforgiving spirit. You want to see how long life is? Just stay mad at a family member for a long time. Oh, I, I'm, I'm saying. Look, the, the point is this. He said, 
that you'll have endurance. Can I tell you this? Some things about the Christian life require endurance. Sometimes just showing up requires endurance. I'm glad you showed up today. But let me just tell you, uh, it, you're not, in spite of what some people may feel, uh, you're, God's not ever going to wake you up at 4 a.m. to the sound of angels' wings flapping and just miraculously pumping your favorite music into your bedroom so that you can gently float off the bed and like, <laughs> that's not the way it works. You know what I have to do? And I, I'm, as the older I get, the earlier I wake up. Uh, before long, I'm going to start going to bed at four o'clock in the afternoon and getting up at two in the morning. But as I get older, even, look, the fact is sometimes I have to set that alarm clock. Now, I'm, I'm one of those people that wakes up before the alarm clock. Let me tell you something. Some things require endurance, determination. And you've got to learn that. And he says, uh, the last thing here gives you strength and it brings true deliverance. Let me read this. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. I love that. No matter what you're held by, chained by, he can bring deliverance. No matter what holds you back, he can give deliverance. And that is his promise. Know who you are in Jesus Christ. When you begin to discover who you are, that your identity is only to be found in Jesus Christ, not your accomplishments, not your past, not your failures. But when you find your identity in Christ, it changes everything. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us to find our true identity, which comes only through you. And I pray that you bless us and be with us. God, we love you today. We thank you for all that you're doing in our midst and in our church. Now, before I finish my prayer, while your head's bowed, what did God speak to you about today? You can pray with our prayer team after the service. We have to my left and your right, we'll have a prayer team waiting to pray with you no matter what it is about. Or maybe you need to take steps toward God, who God says you are. Maybe you're struggling with your identity. Take those steps toward knowing your identity in Christ. Or maybe today you'd say, you know what, I need to be saved. I need to receive Christ as my Savior. I don't even understand all this stuff you're talking about. Know this, God loves you. Jesus will save you. You say, how do I get saved? Well, it's pretty clear that God does the saving, not you or not me, so it's not joining a church. It's not writing your name down on some church membership role, but salvation comes through faith alone and Christ alone. And today, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what that means is that you acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins and resurrected from the grave, and that you want him to forgive you and be the Lord of your life. And you want to receive him and say, doesn't mean you turn over a new leaf, doesn't mean you got to get better or quit doing stuff before you come to him. Just like the old uh, hymn that Billy Graham used to sing at all of his uh, crusades, just as I am. God takes you just like you are. And so today, today in the room or online, you can pray to receive Christ. If you pray to receive Christ, Say something like this to God. I believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on the cross and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to come into my life and save me and to change me. I acknowledge you as the Lord of my life. And I ask you to change me forever. If you'll say something like that, mark it on your next step card today before you leave. Drop it in one of the boxes on the way out or online. Just check that. Uh, online as well. There's a, there's a spot down at the bottom there that you can check that. Father, help us today as we go our way. God, help this to be a day where we begin to learn who we are in Christ. And we begin to understand that most of these problems that we're facing in our culture today would be resolved if we just simply knew who we are, that we are to be identified in Christ. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.